death in this parable. Even the son of the vineyard owner dies. And at the end of the parable, Jesus asks the Pharisees and the chief priests and the elders in the temple, because Jesus is in the Jerusalem temple, it's the last week of his life, and he asks them, so when the vineyard owner comes, what do you think that vineyard owner is going to do? And they respond, he would put those wretches to a miser miserable death. By the way, the word wretch shows up in Amazing Grace. And a little bit later in that verse that Chris was referencing about the chief cornerstone, at least in the Matthew version of it, the word is amazing. So we got amazing and we got wretches, so we're going to sing Amazing Grace in a few minutes. But he would put those wretches to a miserable death. So we have violence in our world, and we saw horrific, unexplainable violence this past Monday in Las Vegas. It's awful, and one of the things that makes it so awful is because it is so unexplainable. It's so random. Why? And it's so huge, the largest uh, gun massacre in United States history. And that's scary. And we don't ask necessarily what next or when next. We just ask who next, because these, seems, these things seem to keep on occurring. It seems that we live in a very vulnerable world, a very vulnerable society where even two Sundays ago, after an usher training here at St. Mark's, and we talked about potential problems, we went home and Sunday night on the news there was a shooting outside of a church in Tennessee. 1,600 children, 17, old, 17 years old and younger, uh, die every year of gun violence. Another, uh, another 15,000 15, are wounded in some kind of gun shooting every single year in the United States. It's a lot. But the, anyway, my battery or my quarter having troubles. We live in a violent place, and Jesus seemed to acknowledge that. And the Pharisees, when they answered that question, they seemed to acknowledge that. Maybe that's all they could imagine. Violence begets violence. Maybe that's all in their world that they could imagine. Violence begets violence. Maybe that's all our world's leaders can imagine. Violence begets violence, more violence. And yet at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, something else happens. Yes, there was another violent event. The son of the vineyard owner, perhaps, one way to look at it, comes to the people and is crucified. Jesus dies on the cross, a very violent act, executed on the cross. Execution, violence. And yet on the third day, when the vineyard owner comes, the vineyard owner does not put those miserable wretches to a death. In fact, Jesus is raised, and there is forgiveness, and there is mercy, and there is grace, and there is a new way to live, and there is resurrection, and there is life, and there is possibility of looking at things differently rather than violence begets violence. Violence might lead to peace or hope or new life. That's at least our hope of the good news as Christians this day. It's a hope and a prayer that those things can occur rather than violence begets violence. So the Philippians reading that Julie read, it was Saul of Tarsus's autobiographical statement about who he was. I was a Jew of all Jews, circumcised on the eighth day. I grew up under the best teachers. I was it as to the law, a righteous man, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. We have a text that we just read in the church from someone who says he persecuted the church, persecuted the Christians, put Christians to death. Violence. And yet something changed. He meets Jesus. He meets the risen Jesus. He knows hope. He knows new life. He knows grace. He knows mercy. He looks into his heart and sees how evil his heart is, how violent his heart is, and he changes his way of living. And that's why we have this autobiographical statement. And he says three times, I regard that former life as loss. Whatever I was, whoever I was, in my flesh, in my heart, in my education, in my financial abilities, in my whatever, I regard it all as loss. Get rid of it. In fact, the fourth time he says it even stronger, it's rubbish, but in Greek it's not rubbish, it's crap or dung or if you get my drift. It's pretty bad. He says, I regard it all as that. That's what my life was. But now I have a new possibility, a new life, and it's not my righteousness, it's the righteousness I have in Jesus Christ. <laughs> and verse 12 is a confession of faith that we can use today and every day. 
Verse 12, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Even me, a miserable wretch who would have been put to a miserable death. There's grace for this wretch. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. You, you all say that. Christ Jesus has made me his own. One more time. Christ Jesus has made me his own. So then we look to the Reformation. It's 100 or 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Last week I mentioned something about the 95 Theses today. Some say the Reformation would never have occurred for Martin Luther, obviously without God and Jesus and Holy Spirit, but also without a man named Frederick the Wise, or Frederick the Elector, also called Frederick the Protector, Frederick the Protector of Martin Luther. He was the governor, so to speak, of the area of Saxon Germany. He was the, the leader, and a very strong Roman Catholic. He made pilgrimage, pilgrimages to Rome, brought back relics. These are bones and fragments of crosses and of apostles and different pieces, bits and pieces. And he brings them back to Germany so the people have something to hold on to when they worship, when they look for forgiveness through the indulgences. 1499, he builds the Castle Church. Castle Church in Wittenberg. He builds the Castle Church. 1499, it has 17 altars. It has 117 shrines. It has over 19,000 relics. And his castle church is a 24-7 business. He has priests set up 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they receive people's offerings and confessions, and the money goes in the coin box, and the money goes into the temple treasury, or at least Frederick's treasury, because of all he has. The Pope had even issued an edict, a papal bull, saying, send all your relics to Frederick. <laughs> He's the elector. In other words, he elects, helps to elect popes. <laughs> but also because he has so much of a museum and a collection, and we want to add to his collection and make sure it's all well taken care of. So send your stuff to Frederick. So Martin Luther shows up, 1517. 95 Theses, and starts talking against indulgences and against relics. And Frederick says, what am I to make of this German brother of mine who is speaking out against not just the Pope, but also against me? What's Frederick going to do? 1519, Martin Luther is summoned to the Diet of Worms, not for lunch, but the Diet of Worms, where he says, here I stand. I can't change my writings. I can't change what I believe. We are justified by grace through faith. And the church kicks him out. He's excommunicated. He becomes a fugitive. And he would have been arrested and sentenced maybe even to death. But Frederick sends his secret service men to kidnap Martin Luther away from the Roman Catholic authorities. And they hide him. And while he is in hiding, he writes the German Bible, translating it from Greek and Hebrew. Frederick and Martin Luther don't meet, though, until about 1522. 1522, still all these relics, still all these indulgences. Frederick really hadn't taken Martin Luther seriously. He just wanted to protect him because he also wanted to protect his own money. But they meet, and Martin Luther basically gets in Frederick's face and says, your indulgences, your relics, he says, they are laughed at by the devil. They are neither commanded nor commended by God. Get rid of them. And Frederick, who had been holding on tightly to these relics, to this way of living, he lets it go. He gives it up. He basically says, because he just learns that grace through faith, and he basically learns, Christ Jesus has made me his own. Wow, I don't need these relics. We don't need these relics. It was a mind-blowing event for Frederick. He dies in 1525, trusting in his eternal salvation, not because of relics and indulgences, but because of grace through faith, because of Martin Luther. So for us today, this week I was talking to uh, Bill Swart. Is Bill here? Right. Our uh, Liam's granddad. Liam was down here ringing the bells down here on this end. 
Liam's granddad. Bill swore. We were talking about evangelism. Bill said he learned years ago this little phrase. He said, for evangelism, take all that you know about yourself, like St. Paul did when he was Saul of Tarsus, the good and the bad. Take all that you know about yourself, your own violence as well as your own wealth. Take all that you know about yourself and replace it with all that you know about Jesus Christ. Jesus is teaching. Jesus is love, his mercy, his crucifixion, his resurrection. Replace all that you know of, of yourself with all that you know of Jesus, and you'll leave it, lead a transformed life. That's what happens with Saul becoming Paul. It's what happened with Frederick <laughs> becoming Frederick of the indulgences, or Frederick of the castles, to Frederick the protector and Frederick the Wise. So today, Christ Jesus has made us His own. What does that mean or look like in your life? What violence can we give up in order to allow Christ's peace to dwell within us? What relics do we give up? What do we hold on to that we trust for our salvation that we need to get rid of in order to trust in Christ for our salvation? Even what guns and what weapons do we need to give up to trust in God's grace for our salvation? They're not easy answers, and violence comes to us daily, and violence comes through us daily, how we act, what we say, and sometimes we can't help it. But there are things we can control, and there are things that we can give up to God, even ourselves, in order to make Christ Jesus part of us because Christ Jesus has made us His own. Christ Jesus has made me His own. Even this miserable wretch, Christ Jesus has made me His own. Thanks be to God.